Hi folks, welcome along back to Percussion Discussion and uh, today you are in for a real treat and I'm in for a real treat. In the words of Alice Cooper, the number one drummer in the whole of rock and roll, we've got with us Mr. Glenn Sobel. Thank you for doing this, Glenn. This is amazing. Thanks for having me and that is way too much to live up to. <laughs> Not my words. <laughs> I appreciate that. How are you doing? I'm really good, mate. And, and how are you at the moment? It's weird times at the moment. Well, yeah, I think that's easy to say that, sure. You know, we just got to make the best of it. Mm. Unless you mean it's a weird time difference between you and me. You're about eight, <laughs> nine hours ahead. There is, I think it's uh, it's 20 past one in the morning here. So yeah. uh, there, but yeah. That, that is a weird time. <laughs> uh, it's fine. <laughs> Nocturnal, it's not a problem. But yeah, it's odd times. It's strange. You know, are you managing to keep busy at the moment, Glenn? Yeah, here and there. Obviously not as much as when there's quote unquote normal times, but yeah, sure. I've been teaching online a little bit and there's been sessions here and there mm. and other things. I, I can't talk about it too much because it's a while until it's out, but I got involved with training an actor who's playing a drummer in a movie. Cool. And he's one of the stars of the movie. And it's it's going to be, I think, a fairly big deal. I mean, you never know how it's going to be made and received and but it's it's a very good sized starring role of somebody who's playing a drummer, so that took up a good amount of time. Oh, that's interesting. So, will it be quite obvious when this movie comes out who it is, and it's going to be quite oh, an yeah. obvious one? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think so. Ah, oh, that's interesting. I look forward to seeing that. Now, if we don't mind, can we go back to where? Yeah, I have a much better appreciation for. <laughs> now, What's that? Uh, do you mind if we go back to where it all We're getting started? some of those those timing latency yeah. issues. Ah, it's only eight hours. It's fine. We'll be fine. So, yeah, wh where did it all begin for you, Glenn? Where, where did drumming start? Well, it, for guys that are anywhere near my age, it started for a lot of similar reasons because of bands like Rush and Led Zeppelin and growing up with classic rock radio. It's such a typical answer, but... I can't deny that. I heard Rush exit stage left and it was my friend's older brother that had it. And to me, it was the coolest thing I had ever heard. So it was like, what's this? I got to check this out. I got to buy this record. And that started on getting all the other studio recordings. Then there was Led Zeppelin. That started with a live record song remains the same. I always got the live records first. You know, it was a good crash course in the band with a lot of the greatest hits. Plus there's usually a drum solo and that's how it started. Mm, absolutely. Now, as far as education goes for drumming, I, I did you get involved in the drumline thing? In, in Oh, yeah. You did? Yeah. I, I started playing in junior high school, middle school, they call it now. But that was two years of middle school where I started playing and learning to read in an orchestra, beginning band. And there was a lot of guys, like half the guys wanted to play drums. And so we had to pick numbers out of a hat. And there were two guys left, me and another kid. And I picked the right number. <laughs> and... That started it, major crossroads moment, right? Yeah. But did that for two years. And then in ninth grade in high school, I started in marching band, sure. Because mm. I, I always, I have an opinion um, that the, 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 the drummers, young drummers in the US have an advantage over the rest of the world for having great hands and great chops from, from having this amazing thing at their disposal, you know? I don't know if you agree with that. I, I certainly do. We got an advantage. I don't know. Simon Phillips might disagree with that. <laughs> generally. Guys like that. Generally. You know what I mean? Because yeah. to have that level of, because if you don't cut it, you're not in, you don't do it. It's as simple as that, isn't it? You've got to, you've got well, to perform. I'll tell you. Yeah, sure. Marching band, we had great instructors that were coming from college drum lines or drum corps. And it was excellent for building hand technique. There, there was a stiff, there is a stiff element of marching band where everything is very rigid. Mm. And for drum set playing, you got to loosen up. But it wasn't just that. It was reading mm. that we really got to be exposed to in a huge way. I was doing orchestra in high school where, you know, you spend 50 bars counting a rest and then play one triangle hit, you know, <laughs> things like that. But learn how to read in different time signatures, did uh, the high school musicals, spring drum line, we did a little bit. So school in general was a huge advantage. I can't deny that. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I think, you know, for, you, you can kind of, you can tell some of the drummers who've had this, this drum line thing 
and the chops are incredible. You know, just if some, something as simple as a single stroke roll is just so, something that we can't, it's not always accessible to us in the rest of the world. And I think, I think everyone should have drumline. Uh, available to them in, in education but that's that's my opinion anyway <laughs> yeah it's a good point yeah so uh obviously where where did the the kind of professional thing start when you know how soon were you straight into paid gigs with 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 great bands and you know doing your thing well there were gigs and then there eventually were paid gigs there's <laughs> yeah, a difference no but i was in a band again a very typical story i'm born and raised in la mm -hmm. i'm a native that's a rare thing at least People think it's a rare thing, but I grew up here and started going to the Sunset Strip when I was 16, 17 years old, checking out a lot of the bands. But also I was going to places like the Baked Potato, mm. which is the world famous little hole in the wall. It's the Jazz Fusion Club. And back then, oh, my God, like Vinnie Corleuta was playing there on a regular basis. I was watching Greg Bissonette, one of my mentors, uh, Tom Breckline, David Garibaldi, Jeff Percaro, you name it. They were playing this tiny place. That was school. So I was coming through, coming from both of these worlds, Hollywood Sunset Strip and also the places like Baked Potato. And to me, that seemed like more of an advantage than being in marching band. I thought, wow, we're in L.A. We're so lucky that we have all this. And, and what was the original question? I forgot already. I can't remember. Uh, yeah. Oh, it was, it was what, you know, what, how, how long did it take to get into the regular gigs? Oh, right, right. Of course. <laughs> Professional gigs. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, going to the Sunset Strip and everything, eventually my first real rock band, which is my best friends from high school, we had a band called Bourbon Street and we were playing parties, backyard parties. We played covers, we played originals. And then we finally started getting some club gigs and eventually we played Gazzari's mm. on the Sunset Strip and we played the Roxy. We didn't make any money, but you know, when you're working on all that, it's just like the ACDC song. It's a long way to the top. So yeah. we were just so happy to have a gig that we can invite all our friends to. Yeah, It was a very prestigious thing. So eventually there were paid cover gigs that I was doing at some local places. And then my first real professional sort of recording gig, which was Tony McAlpine. I was 22 when I got that gig and Greg Bissonette was the one that had recommended me. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah, beyond cool. Well, do you know, funnily enough, um, I had a Tony McAlpine album and there's, you, you can play a mean shuffle and the song is uh, Albert's Fat Sister. Ah, uh, yeah. I had that. And I remember thinking, ah, oh, that's good. I don't know why I had the album. I don't even know where it came from, but I had it. And that's a great tune, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, it's probably my favorite song on the record. Just because it was such a departure for Tony. He's considered, especially back then, on the metal fusion side of things. Like his first record, Steve Smith played drums on oh. uh, Edge of Insanity from 85. And Steve Smith was the perfect person to bridge the fusion and rock metal divide. So that kind of set the pace for a lot of that genre. And so that record, it was more of that same, but that song is kind of like, we thought of it as like a talk show theme, like the Tonight Show or something. It has the big band aspect to it. And Branford Marsalis is a special guest on that track. Yeah. Yeah, that was wild. My first record, and there was a Grammy winner on it. You know, that's, the way, that's the way to do it if you're going to do it. it. And it's such a great, uh, you know, anybody listening, it's there on Spotify. Have a listen. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a shuffle and a half. It really is. Yeah, it's an up-tempo, big band-ish tune with a backbeat. Yeah. But, you know, I like that I didn't know the tune that well when I recorded that because there were some good things that would happen just in the moment where if you knew it too well and there was a ton of rehearsal, it might be too sterile. You know, a lot of that record was very spontaneous yeah. in a way. That's the best way. That's being creative. That's, that's what music's about, isn't it really? You know, it should be. Should sure. be anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Um, and yeah, it's still, it's still one of my favorite records I've ever done. And it was the first. Yeah. I mean, that, that says a lot, doesn't it? And, and it is a great album. And, and Tony McAlpine is, is well, he's incredible. Um, absolutely. Yeah, he was willing to take a chance on a brand new guy like yeah. me. You know, that, that says a lot, too, because he had a, a really strong lineage of drummers mm. before that. You know, whether it was Steve Smith 
or there was Tommy Aldridge when they had that group with Rudy Sarzo and, yes. and Rob Rock singing. Uh, there was Dean Castronova, of course, another huge influence, Mike Tirana. There was a lot of great players. So I thought, okay, I got to bring my A game and then some, I got to step it up. Yeah. So, so how long did you have that gig for then? Uh, it was, it was probably a couple years. The thing was that at that time that I got the gig, it was late 92. I was 21 actually when I got the gig. And then we did that record in 93. Here's the big problem. If you know your sort of rock history of that time, well, what happened in the early mid nineties is that grunge came out and mm. kind of erased the slate. And people always talk about the hair bands that got affected and they were mm. just overnight it changed to where all of a sudden mtv radio they weren't playing that stuff so much but what else got affected was shred guitar yeah yeah of course yeah it was totally uncool all of a sudden mm -hmm. to be able to play that well and that with that much virtuosity all of a sudden it was about this dirty grunge sound alice in chains and nirvana and minimalist and you know stuff that was intentionally sloppy and people like were so resentful over that what they can't even play in time they're speeding up and slowing down i mean <laughs> we get it now but back then it was like this whole threat to what we did because it kind of shoved those genres to the back yeah absolutely and but most bands have survived it and they're still around. A lot of the hair bands are, st are still here doing it, aren't they? And, and yeah, they get out on the nostalgia circuit. So for that reason, you know, the gig, it was a couple of years. We With Tony, we tried to do a band with a singer, but that was pretty short-lived. But it, it led to other gigs in the similar genre of shred guitar, which I guess if you're going to be known for anything, that's a good thing. Yeah. So there was Chris Impelitary, who I played with in Japan a lot. That was the next gig. He has a singer always, mm -hmm. and that's Rob Rock. Not to be confused with Bobby Rock, the drummer, but yeah, Rob Rock. And But the band is centered around Chris's amazing shredding guitar playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, you know, and of course, I, I don't want to keep you too long. I know you're a busy man. So your employer for the last, gosh, I don't know. Uh, how long have you been with Alice Cooper now? Is it... 10 years been, it's it's been 10 years april 30th will be 10 years yeah and, and i have to say that gig is probably my dream gig uh <laughs> such great great songs to play and yeah you, you only ever hear good things about alice cooper as a person you know so i'm sure you <laughs> yeah so how did the gig come about if you don't mind me asking glenn yeah well there's always a story behind that right mm. Uh, that came about, it started back in 2010 through Tommy Henriksen, who I'm in the Alice Cooper band with. Yeah. Him and I go way back. We were in a band together in 96 where Tommy was the lead singer and bass player. He He's amazing. He has reinvented himself over and over and over again. And so at the time, that was a band that it had a record deal, but the deal kind of ended but Tommy became, eventually, he became a producer. And it's the producers that get the session players on the gig. So I was doing sessions for Tommy. And in 2010, Tommy was living in Nashville and he was working with Bob Ezrin a lot, the producer, mm -hmm. who produced Alice back in the day, as well as Pink Floyd and Kiss and Peter Gabriel. He's, he's a legend. So they were going to do a session where they were going to do exact note-for-note -note knockoffs of a few Alice hits Mm -hmm. Like no Mr. Nice Guy, School's Out, Elected, etc. And then Alice was going to re-sing it. And the yeah. question is why? Why do that? Well, if a movie or a video game or a TV show wants School's Out, well, now here's this newly recorded master that the artist and artist management owns. There is no record label yeah. to deal with. It's, it, it's a loophole. It cuts yeah. out the record label, the original rights holders, cuts them out of the deal. You know, and Alice is definitely not the first to do this. There's many bands that have re-recorded their own material. So we had Bob Ezrin, the original guy that produced Schools Out and all these songs. So that's what I did. Tommy was in charge of getting all the session players on and doing a lot of the work, and Bob was overseeing it. And it went well enough to where a year later, they asked Bob to produce the Alice Cooper show, rehearse the band, get the show together, and Bob suggested Tommy and me to be a part of the touring lineup. Hmm. And Alice had never 
met me. You know, you do a session for an artist, you don't meet them a yeah. lot of the time. It's just you, producer, a couple of session players, maybe. Yeah. So Alice, what I was suggested to Alice, he said, well, I heard him. I sung over his tracks, but I got to see him. My drummer's got to be flashy. He said yeah. something like that. So Tommy pulled up some YouTube. They were mixing the latest Alice studio record, I think, when this conversation went down. And Alice, based on seeing me do some, I don't know, some of this stuff or whatever. Yeah. And uh, based on that, and then Tommy vouching for my character. I'm not crazy. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not going <laughs> to disappear. It's all very important. Yeah, yeah. But based on all that, Alice said, yeah, okay, that's the guy he's in. And, and Tommy called me up, you know, Mr. New York guy going, yeah, so I'm here with Mr. Cooper and uh, you want to do this gig? And I was half asleep in LA two hours earlier. And I, I said, yeah, sure, man, let's do it. He went, all right, you're in click. <laughs> and that was basically it. I met Alice on the first day of rehearsal. So there was no, no audition, no formal audition thing. No, unless you want to count that recording yeah. session as an audition that I didn't even know was an audition. <laughs> uh, it's better that way. So how much do you enjoy the gig? I mean, it must be a, it must be a great gig because there's some great songs, isn't there? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's never a dull moment on stage. Everybody's cool in the band and crew. Uh, I got no complaints. You know, I mean, being on the road is not perfect. There is no situation, whether you're in a van or flying private, hmm. it could all be exhausting. But if you're around good people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, do we have a little in unstable internet there? Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, that's fine. Don't worry. We're back again now. We're all good. Don't worry. Okay. No. Yeah, it's been great. You know, uh, I got no complaints. Alice is the great boss. He's a super guy. He's, he's always in a good mood. And Cheryl Cooper, his wife, she is in the show. Oh, right. Okay. And she's on tour. It's a very family atmosphere. And now there's also Hollywood Vampires, which has been equally, that's been great. That must be a fun gig as well, uh, you know, to have. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you, listen, it's an incredible light. I guess you were the obvious choice for that. Was that something that Alice Cooper put together himself or was it a, like a collaboration thing? And Well, the way I remember it and the way I see it, you might have different answers for different people, but, you know, Johnny and Alice first met, as far as I know, they first met in the UK in London oh. back in 2011 mm. when Johnny was filming Dark Shadows, the movie. Mm movie the tim burton movie yeah yeah so um yeah they met back then so we were passing through we were passing through london we had a week off mm. because alice had to film his part in that movie and so what happened was a last minute gig got booked it was at the 100 club yes oh a little a small gig yeah yeah it was a special like last minute announced thing where the ticket sold out in yeah. a minute or two and then we got word that day that Johnny Depp was going to come down and play I'm 18 and school's out with us. He's going to show up at Soundcheck and rehearse it. And, and he did. And it was this big meaty thing. And it got in tabloid magazines here and probably there, too. Yeah. And that was where that relationship started, as far as I know. And then at the NAM show in L.A. in 2014, we did a thing called the Johnny Depp Band yeah. at this one nighttime concert. And so the special surprise guests that nobody knew about were Alice and Marilyn Manson and Steven Tyler. Mm. And I think during the rehearsals for all that, Alice's manager, Shep Gordon, was watching going, hmm, this could be a thing <laughs> more than just this one gig. And next thing you know, it is a thing where it's Alice and Johnny and Joe Perry. Yeah. And we get all these special guests joining us. And there was a record, which was a covers record mostly. Yeah. yeah with two originals. And then the next one was all originals except two covers, the opposite. Yeah. And I'm on half the first record and the whole second record. I love the second record. I hear so many different influences Thanks. on different songs. I can hear, the, I hear loads of the Stooges in there. I know, which is yeah. a strange thing to, but every time I hear- I, That's I, not it, strange. Is it not? That's no, good. no. You know what? When we do our side gigs, the four of us out of the Alice Cooper band, we'll do our own gigs on off nights. Mm. We do want to be your dog by the student. And Tommy sings it. Yeah, yeah. That makes yeah, we stuff. love playing that stuff. Yeah. And so, I mean, Johnny Depp, people, you know, guys don't get any bigger than him. Is he a cool guy to be in a band with? Does he just do the same as the rest of you? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, he wants to just be one of the guys in the band. He loves making music. That's what he did originally. He was living in Florida and playing gigs with his band. And in 1983, they moved to L.A. Mm. to make it as a band. But then he kind of got sidetracked with the whole acting thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, must be fun. But never lost his passion. Oh, that's great. Playing. Yeah, and loves doing it. Superb. I mean, I want to just go back to Alice Cooper for, 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 for a minute, if you don't mind. Now, there's the early stuff, um, you know, there's such, such great songs. And every time I hear that Neil Smith play it back on the old stuff, there's such a kind of a, almost a jazzy influence in there, isn't there? Oh, yeah. And I, I always compare Neil Smith to Bill Ward from Sabbath. I think you could, you could put either of them in either band and nobody would really notice because they're <laughs> very similar. Um, you know, stuff like obviously Billion Dollar Babies, that must be yeah. great fun to play. Do you have, do you have a favorite that you, that, you know, a highlight of the show? Well, sure. That, that's one of them always. That's such yeah. an iconic drum part. Mm. You can't change that intro because it's so recognizable. Yeah. But yeah, you're, you're right about the jazzy element, you know, especially things on the Killers record stuff like that um you know and there's also a little bit of a keith moon vibe in there with the eighth notes on the bass drum yeah, yeah, yeah. especially songs like elected you know but yeah when i did that original recording session where we had to do these note for note knockoffs i had to not only transcribe note for note all of neil's parts but i had to do my best neil smith impression yeah of course yeah and so that was that was a good thing to do to prepare for the gig mm. it, yeah and so um yeah, they, so, they're just they're great guys. The original band guys, they've come out and they've played with us on the UK dates in 2017. They did the mini set at the end of the, the show. So did you get on? Did you get on great with Neil? Did, oh, yeah. 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 Great guy. Him, Dennis Dunaway, Michael Bruce. Great guys like Alice. They all love telling stories from back in the day. And, you know, at the end of the set, they would come out and do like a four song mini set. And then all nine of us would play schools out with two drum sets and two bass players and what felt like 17 guitar players, that's you know, incredible. that's incredible. And, uh, that must, that's yeah, a, that was a blast. That's dreams come true. Isn't it? You know, yeah. um, now I, I want to just uh, go back to, I think it's 2014 when you toured with Motley Crue. I think it was their farewell tour. Um, which yeah. would be great fun. I'm a Motley Crue fan through and through always have been, um, I had hair once, quite a lot of it, and and uh, I don't look like the average crew fan, but um, and I know you you subbed for Tommy, didn't you, on a few on a few of the was it four or five of the shows or something? Yeah, it was five shows, a week's worth of shows in 2015 that I did that. That was yeah. it was a crazy week because I was doing both sets. That must have been a killer. That must have been so hard to do. You know, um, the first show especially. But I figured the trick out was to not let myself cool down between mm. sets, stay mm. warmed up, just change out of the really sweaty T-shirt into a fresh T-shirt yeah. and, and stay warmed up with the heating pad and everything. Yeah. That, that helped after the first night. And then a masseuse, they, they brought down a deep tissue masseuse to the venue a couple of times that week. That sure helped. Yeah. But I'll tell you, you know, um, I love Motley Crue as well. I told you about that band in high school. We mm. played backyard parties. We used to play some Motley Crue songs at those backyard parties. So, I mean, they were so surprised when I told them what was going on way back then, my old high school buddies. But, you know, the Alice Cooper set, in a way, it's, it's a lot more hectic to play than a Motley Crue set because, number one, Alice doesn't talk between songs. Does he not? Never. He never breaks character. On the vampires, yes, because that's a different thing. Yeah. The Alice Cooper set, you will never hear Alice talk between songs. Mm. Mm. It's just one into the next, into the next. And the nature of Alice's music, it's like Billion Dollar Babies or Under My Wheels, it's busier. Yeah, yeah. Not always, but a lot of the time. Now, Motley Crue is very hard hitting. It has its own set of challenges. But Vince talks definitely between songs and Mick <laughs> Mars would do a five minute guitar solo at least. And Nikki Six would do a speech on how the band met that could take eight, 10 minutes. I could step off of the riser, take a break. I'm like, wow, this is great. I forgot what it's like to have a real break in the action and catch my breath for a minute. And, and, and their songs, they're heavy hitting, but it's a lot of four on the floor, yeah. girls, 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 or primal scream. One of my favorites, heavy groovers like that. So did you, did you know 
like the majority of the songs or did you have to do a little bit of study and listening just to get get the set together well both because of course I, I, like you i'm a fan from way back and it helped that we were out on tour with them on and off for yeah. a while but they have a lot of different arrangements live to accommodate for different pyro cues and things like that. Yeah. So I made sure to make cheat sheets of each and every song, whether I thought I knew it or not, you know, a song like uh, wild side, it's actually, it's pretty tricky. Mm. The way they get in and out of the chorus is different every time. And there are actually bars of two, four in there, which you may not realize until you have to learn it, but you can't leave that stuff to chance. Yeah. And everybody hears the click track in their in-ear monitors and everyone gets the count offs. You have to be very well aware of what's happening. Yeah. You can't just wing it. Even if you think you know it perfectly, what if something goes wrong, you know, or, you know, there's bombs next to the drum set going off. There's a few distractions. Oh, incredible. And so I'm assuming on those gigs, you'll have used Tommy's kit or, or most of it. No, no, no. Actually I use my kit, but between sets, Alice's Tom, uh, I mean, Tommy's tech, Nick and my tech, Michael, they scaled down my kit. So it was double bass, but one rack time, a 13 yeah. and then 16, 18 mm. took away all the stuff on the left to make room for the music stand. So it was just a stripped down version of my drums. Yeah. So you didn't have to go on the roller coaster then. You didn't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I didn't do it during the show, but <laughs> I, I read it. I wrote it once during the daytime. Oh. oh yeah. It's on YouTube. Yeah. You can see oh, it. All right. And how was that? And it's hard. <laughs> it's it's not the totally being upside down that's the hardest that's weird because everything feels farther away yeah. it's when you're at that 45 degree angle and the the harness is digging into your stomach and you start like you, you can't breathe because the, the wind's getting knocked out of you yeah you know Whoa. that's what was hard and he's up there and he's playing and tommy's got the headset mic on go what's up you know and what's while he's that? playing i'm like thinking i told him later i'm like how do you do that that's it. But right after his drum solo roller coaster deal would be Mick Mars's guitar solo. I figured out why they placed it there because Tommy's got the oxygen <laughs> to breathe in. And you know what? I was doing that too yeah, yeah, for a good yeah. while. Um, I haven't done it in a while, having oxygen tanks up there, but it's great to grab the thing and press the button on the mask to breathe in some fresh O2. Wow. That, that's dedication. Yeah, it's a good thing it? for drummers. That is dedication. It really is. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, look, Glenn, thank you so much. I, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, this has been a fabulous, I don't know how long we've been talking for about half an hour or so. And uh, it's great. We don't see too much of you in the UK, unfortunately. So uh, it's great. We're going to get this out there and um, share it around. And hopefully everyone's going to enjoy it. And um, well, hopefully we'll be back there soon. I know that we had Hollywood Vampires dates scheduled for last year, like at the O2 Arena. Yeah. They are scheduled for this year. It's like the same, it's around the same times as 2020. Yeah. We'll see, right? Uh, yeah, nobody knows, do they, at the moment? it's um... Exactly. But yeah, I hope to do more drum stuff there. There's been talk here and there of doing clinics or you still have the London drum show? Uh, there was the, yes, the, we've, there's also the UK drum show now, which yes. is up in Manchester. Yeah. You know what? And I, I was almost booked on that one time, but I couldn't work it out schedule wise. Yeah, it's a, it's a big show. It's a the good one show. that's in Manchester. Yeah, absolutely. That's the one. It's um, it's a big, it's a great show. Um, some great players there. What I was saying is that the the UK drum show, I, I was almost scheduled on that one time, but we just couldn't quite work it out. And there's been talk about London drum show. It's just it's logistics. Yeah, of course, always is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's look, the timing of everything. Do you do you enjoy doing the clinic thing? So I know I've seen some stuff on Drumio, which has always been fascinating. Um, do, do you enjoy the clinic situation? Sure. Yeah, I love doing that. I mean, what you know? Where else do you get to see such a self-indulgent <laughs> performance by a drummer than a drum clinic? You know, a drum solo that's 10, 12 minutes. You wouldn't see that in an arena drum solo. No. It's no. like you're getting paid to be creative and figure out some new things and push the boundaries of what it is you do. And absolutely. I love hanging with drummers and yeah. talking like we're talking right now. Yeah, absolutely. Now there's nothing better. Well, look, Glenn, I know uh, you're a busy guy. Thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate you taking the time out to do it. So um, hopefully we'll catch you later on this year. Who knows? We'll see what happens. Yeah. Fingers crossed. That's uh, hopefully going to happen. Appreciate it. Thank you, mate. Take care. You got it. Thanks, Matty. Really